Hi, Nathan, are you on? Okay, thanks everyone for staying on the line. We're going to get started. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight's, tonight's webinar. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. My name is Melissa and I work with the National Ocean Sciences Bowl. Um, if, you're, um, if you're a member of the NOSB, we welcome you. I know we also have uh, members of the MECC tonight joining us, so we also appreciate you uh, being here. Um, we're happy to provide this opportunity uh, this is the third NOSB Ask an Expert webinar, and tonight um, we're with an NOSB 2020 sponsor, the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, which is part of the U.S. Department of Energy. And we're really thrilled tonight that they um, have provided some experts to answer all your questions on marine renewable energy, um, both just the topic in general and if you have any career questions. Um, I'm just going to go over a very brief bit of housekeeping information with you before I turn it over to our experts tonight. Um, as you've seen, uh, everyone is muted tonight except our speakers. That's just to keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, so during tonight's presentation, at any time you have a question, um, there is a chat box. That's where you're going to want to enter all your questions. I'm going to be monitoring those through the webinar, and we're going to save all the questions till the end. Um, and I'll read them aloud at the end to our experts so they can answer them for you. Um, also, just a note, we are recording this webinar. Uh, it'll be up on the NOSB website tomorrow, and we'll also share it through our social media channels. Um, we do these webinars um, because we think they're a really useful tool for the NOSB students and coaches who are preparing for the competition, but we're actually happy if they can be of a broader use to others as well. So please, if you found this webinar interesting tonight um, or helpful, we ask that you please share it amongst your friends and colleagues as well so that um, everyone can benefit um, from tonight's webinar. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to our NREL uh, presenters so that they can go through their presentation. Thanks, Melissa. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to Jennifer Garson from DOE, who will give an, inter an introduction to today's, web, uh, today's webinar. Thanks. Yep, so my name is Jennifer Garson. I'm a senior advisor in the Water Power Technologies Office. We are in the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about our office. Uh, as well as uh, some of our new initiatives that we think are really exciting, and then turn it over to our technical experts at the lab. So, what's the U.S. Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office? We invest in early stage research uh, done both at our labs and through grants and other opportunities to uh, fund water power technologies. So, we fund both things in hydropower technology, so using uh, dams and other diversions uh, for capturing energy, uh, as well as funding some of our work to validate uh, new systems harnessing marine energy applications. So we focus on, um, uh, on research, performance, and releasing objective information that gives our broader stakeholders uh, information about water power technologies and other environmental issues. So in 2020, we're focused on two research portfolios, both in hydropower and marine. One is looking at how does hydropower, one of our first forms of renewable energy, really help to serve the grid. 
and then developing new technologies harnessing marine energy to power the blue economy. And so when we talk about hydropower and marine renewable uh, energy, we're talking about a, a lot of different opportunities to harness the power of energy. So on the hydropower side, we talk about things like upgrades for existing hydropower, uh, non-powered dams. So there are a lot of dams all throughout the country where we don't actually currently harness energy, and we're looking at environmentally sustainable options for harnessing energy out of those dams. Uh, looking at new low impact projects and pump storage, which actually represents about 95% of the energy storage currently on our electricity grid, which has an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir and helps to provide the storage needed for enhancing other renewable energy technologies. And then marine hydrokinetics, uh, which is what we're really going to talk about today, which is looking at wave, tidal, river current, and ocean current applications. So how do you harness the power of energy and turn it into forms of uh, energy and electricity? And so just a quick overview of what DOE has done on uh, MHK, which is Marine and Hydrokinetic Technology. Uh, we started in 2008 uh, as actually part of the Wind and Water Power Office uh, and released some of our early solicitations, which are the basically the things that we put out to the public for them to give really good ideas for research and development that can help us tackle some of these big issues in hydropower and marine energy. But uh, in 2010, we released the largest solicitation, so the largest grant opportunity to the marine energy industry. We've been doing a lot of work at trying to understand what's the wave and tidal resources that are actually out there that we can harness from an electricity perspective. We established some marine energy centers, which are university partners who are really trying to help us tackle R&D objectives. We had our first grid-connected tidal project uh, back in 2014. Really since then, we've been looking at things like how do we really fully understand both the energy and system requirements needed to develop MHK technologies. Back in 2017, we actually ran a, a prize competition, uh, the Wave Energy Prize, which looked at how do you drive down the cost for these types of systems to really harness wave energy specifically. Uh, and then back in 2017, 2018, we, are, uh, we, we awarded a a grant to Oregon State University to develop the first open water test facility to really test out wave energy applications. Because one of the, the key challenges that we have in wave energy is how do you make, how do you prove that these things can really work at a larger scale? And the coast of Oregon represents quite large waves. And so it was a way for us to actually build out a testing facility to test and see whether the things that we funded throughout this period will really work in the real world setting. And then uh, my, uh, my colleague Ariel will talk a little bit uh, further about this, but this year we actually launched our first marine energy collegiate competition as well, which is really looking at how do we harness the uh, ingenuity of students at universities across the country to really help us think through the opportunities for marine energy. And so one of the projects that we funded this year uh, that I talked about a little bit earlier is really looking at how can marine energy, which is uniquely suited to serve some of these marks in the blue economy. So the Power in the Blue Economy initiative seeks to understand the power requirements of emerging coastal and maritime markets and advanced technologies that could integrate marine renewable energy to relieve the power constraints and promote economic growth. So what does that really mean? I'm actually looking at a picture of an aquaculture farm right now, but um, so next slide. So when we started really digging into thinking about where marine energy is actually suited, we started looking at a bunch of different markets where how can you use the power of the ocean to power different market opportunities? And we have sort of two market segments looking at power of sea and resilient coastal communities, but our goals of this powering the blue economy is really understanding what do people really need uh, when they're developing systems uh, for uh, harnessing the power of the ocean and actually quantifying marine energy in emerging ocean markets? Markets. Uh, how do we accelerate marine energy technology readiness through near-term opportunities? Um, and then how do we work with some of our private sector partners? So to put it in perspective, we look to work with people like the Department of Defense or the Department of Commerce, really trying to understand what are their energy requirements and how do we actually develop systems that can meet some of those energy requirements. 
And so what are we doing from a DOE perspective? Well, we really try to think about how do we bring together some of these end user needs, which is just a fancy way of saying what is the actual, what are the people needs? So whether it's somebody who's developing ocean observing platforms, if they're trying to collect a certain amount of data or a certain amount of information, how do we figure out what the power needs are to actually power those systems? Uh, and then how do we bring together the right partners? How do we bring the right innovation? How do we bring the right R&D to some of these challenges? So we have a lot of amazing partners in this space, people like NREL, who are obviously on the call with us, but also the Pacific, North, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, um, the Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Defense, um, some of our other uh, equities and people who really care about this space. How do we really understand what their needs are and then design programs that can help meet those needs? So it's a really interesting both research perspective, but then also how do you really think about science in a way that's really focused on developing solutions that can get out into the hands of the people who need them the most? So we have a couple of different programs that we launched this year uh, through the Department of Energy looking at wave power desalination, which we'll talk a bit about more, but how do you get clean water to people who actually need them most by using the power of the ocean? How do we observe the ocean, which we don't know a whole lot about right now, uh, using the power of the ocean? Uh, and then how do we harness people like students or entrepreneurs or small businesses to help us tackle some of these challenges? So we're really excited from a Department of Energy perspective of rethinking the way that the ocean can actually serve some of these markets the way that the ocean can help us better understand what's out in the ocean and also how to deliver both energy and water to people in need. Thanks, Jen. That was a great introduction to uh, DOE and the Water Power Technologies Office. So I'm going to quickly go uh, give a few slides to give a quick primer on marine renewable energy technologies. Talk a little bit more about exactly the type of marine energy devices that are used before we move on to a little bit more about how these could be coupled with other powering the blue economy and other offshore industries. So just to be clear that when we're talking about you know marine energy, we generally separate it into wave energy and tidal and current energy. And the main difference is the type of physical phenomena that is used to extract power. So when we're talking about wave energy, we're generally looking to get extract power from surface waves and these would be the waves you would see by sitting on a beach and looking out to the horizon and the waves here are generally characterized between or having a duration between 5 to 20 seconds as uh, that's generally the kind of fre uh, frequency range of most of the sites along the United States. You do have then the tidal wave generation and this is more driven by the gravitational pull between the sun and the moon. And we have tidal and currents are very similar as you're looking to extract energy from a more uniform flow of fluid. Uh, so seawater, or even if you're looking at rivers, the freshwater flow coming down the river. And then sometimes there's a little bit of confusion where we used to say tidal waves with tsunamis, but they're actually two different phenomena where tsunamis come from a large underwater disturbances such as earthquakes or landslides that generate a very large swell of water which then separates and propagates until it either hits landmass or dissipates itself. This is a quick map of the resource uh, in the continental U.S. as well as Alaska and Hawaii and shows you on the left hand side what the resource potentials are and how we want or which topics we look to try to extract the most energy from. And uh, I'll preface, we also went a little bit more in detail on some of these topics in the webinar that we helped host with NOSB last year. So if you want a little bit more information, I would suggest also going back and reviewing that webinar as well. And some of the key takeaways is that when we're looking at uh, extracting energy from waves, uh, generally the wave, the, the energy, or I should say power within a wave uh, is proportional to the wavelength and also then uh, proportional to the amplitude of that wave squared. So you can see as the waves get much larger, the energy within that wave can scale up much faster. And then when you're looking to extract energy from tidal or current energy devices, uh, you're looking to really want to maximize the flow velocity 
and the power within a tidal or current stream is related to the velocity of that fluid Q. In wave energy, uh, at the moment we still have what we kind of call the wild west, where if you think of a wind turbine, you kind of know that it's a horizontal three-bladed wind turbine, that's onshore, onshore. That design is kind of standard. At the moment in wave energy, we have a huge array of ideas and concepts that are still being pursued. We generally decompose those into four general categories. The first one is probably the one that most people are most familiar with, which is a point absorber. These look the most like traditional navigational buoys or any type of floating system in the water, where you tend to try and extract energy from the heave motion driven by the waves. You have attenuator devices, which are parallel to the direction of the wave. And these generally are com composed of several linked bodies and the relative motion between these links are used to capture energy. We also have a set that are referred to as oscillating water columns, where here you could have a, a fixed chamber to, or a chamber fixed to the seabed or potentially having a floating option. But here we are actually having an internal chamber which is comprised of air and water. And as the body moves and as the waves hit this device, it causes the surface elevation to rise and fall which will then push this air pocket uh, out and back in through a turbine. And we're extracting power from that method. We also have overtopping devices, which act similar to more like conventional hydro dams is where we're trying to have waves over top and collect in a reservoir, which then flows through a low head turbine extracting power. And the bottom, we have some examples of devices that have been displayed in the past. And here is just, again, demonstrating that all of these uh, devices here are people from developing wave energy technologies in the U.S. And again, it shows that we have a really large array of ideas and hoping to start picking out some that will serve different purposes. And then a few examples of marine current and tidal energy devices. So we have Verdant Power in the left photo here, which is a horizontal three-bladed concept. We have Florida Atlantic University is developing a marine current turbine, which is in very similar design. We also have the Ocean Renewable Energy Corporation, or ORPC's crossflow turbine on the bottom right, uh, which shows there's not quite as, a, as much of a diversity when you're moving from wave to tidal, but there's still several different designs that are competing. And then I'll just mention, although these aren't necessarily very or there's a lot of research in this field. If you were to maybe do a Google search or read some more literature, there's a couple other concepts that people have looked at in the past. The first one shown in the diagram on the left, which is an ocean thermal energy conversion or OTEC. And this is trying to create a, a heat exchanger basically using the warm water from the top surface where, uh, and exchanging or transferring that, en sorry, that energy and heat to cold water that you would take from a lower depth of like a kilometer or more below the sea. And so you'd have to pump a lot of water to shore, pass that through a heat exchanger or something similar to using combustion-based energy sources. And that's something that's been in, uh, researched and still is a potential to help serve certain communities as well. Uh, mostly around the more equator regions where you actually have a large enough temperature between your surface water and deep water. There's also some interest in looking at salinity gradient devices. And in the top right picture is a picture of an estuary where you have the fresh water and the salt water mixing. And here we are looking to use, uh, there's a couple of different designs out here on the bottom right hand corner. We have a pressure retarded osmosis system. We are trying to have a salt water mixture and a fresh water mixture, um, have the fresh water move to the salt water to push the fluid level up to push pressure through a turbine, or you can do a similar mixing of fresh and brinish water to drive a current system. So again, these are not necessarily uh, as much research and on the larger grid utility scale, but there's potential for these to help uh, become a part of powering our blue economy and maybe powering some smaller scale units. So next I'll turn it over to Rebecca to talk a little bit about ocean observation. Great, thank you, Nathan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Fantastic. Hello, it's great to join everyone tonight. My name is Rebecca Green. I'm a senior project leader uh, with NREL. I work on a variety of offshore, uh, offshore wind and marine energy projects including our exciting uh, Powering the Blue Economy initiative through DOE. So it's my pleasure tonight to talk with you more about opportunities for expanding ocean observations through marine energy integration. My own background is in biological oceanography and a specific field of ocean observing called ocean optics, although I've worked across um, numerous areas that I'll be talking about tonight. Next slide. Thank you. So given the theme of this year's National Ocean Sciences Bowl, I thought a great place to start would be to talk about ocean observations and resiliency in the Gulf of Mexico. I've spent much of my last 20 years professionally doing offshore research in the Gulf. Um, so it's very exciting to be looking at this, this pretty robust, if you look at the map here, robust network of ocean observations that are currently exist in the Gulf of Mexico and, and are expanding every day, including a network of buoys, autonomous vehicles, HF radar systems, and water quality monitoring tools, all pulled together in this case uh, by the US, U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System or IU's uh, regional association called GCUS. Uh, this very uh, robust system of observations is critical for human uh, informing human economic and environmental resiliency, including areas of marine ops, coastal hazards, hazards such as related to hurricanes, healthy ecosystems, human health, uh, including related to harm, harmful algal blooms, and understanding long-term change. Next slide. So Jen gave a really great overview of the current Powering the Blue Economy initiative and the sustainable ocean, uh, use of ocean resources for a variety of needs. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that ocean observations and ocean sensing is really a key market within this blue economy with a world market size in the billions of dollars. So a pretty, pretty large and growing market Ocean observations also serve various other blue economy applications, in, including informing uh, fishery status, uh, marine transportation, offshore renewable energy development, and other applications. Overall, uh, ocean observations are common, commonly limited by the availability of power, as I'll be talking about uh, more next. So we got a really great overview uh, from both Jen and, and Nathan on uh, the different types of marine renewable energy sources uh, that are out there, um, including with application um, in this part of our discussion to ocean observation. So uh, we're talking about marine energy as encompassing the harvest of energy from waves, tides, ocean currents, and other sources. To date, uh, most common, this has been most commonly achieved uh, with tidal turbines and util utilization of, of different wave energy converter designs. Um, marine energy also includes the harvest of energy from salinity and temperature gradients, including some really novel applications uh, to observing systems, which I'll show in a couple of slides. Which in, within each of these categories, um, there's been quite a bit of variance. Um, uh, to device attributes, creating a wide range of potential solutions for coupling uh, with extending ocean observing missions. Next slide. So we've spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, as a national lab team, NREL and PNNL, over the last year, uh, looking at how marine energy can be uh, used for powering ocean observations. In particular, we've extensively interviewed um, a wide group of folks from the end user community to understand their power needs for ocean ops, uh, focusing on how marine energy can provide power for the wide range of both fixed and mobile observing platforms, including AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles. When we ask this large group of experts what the main limitations are to their work in observing missions, uh, the availability of power and limitations due to batteries were really the most uh, common concern. So 
So offering a, a real opportunity for integration uh, with marine energy, in situ marine energy um, devices. There are numerous ways in which observations could be uh, enabled with more power for marine energy, including longer deployments, higher sampling rates, and integration of more sensors, such as biochemical and bi biological sensors. Next. So we looked at, um, in interviewing this end user community, the various power requirements uh, needed for ocean observations. Average power requirements were determined across the wide range of sensor types and observing platforms that we learned about. Um, overall, what we learned is that there are significant opportunities for coupling marine energy systems capable of producing less than a kilowatt. Um, in some cases, only a watt, tens of watts, hundreds of watts are needed, depending on the, on the device. As you can see in the diagram below, uh, there's different sensor types um, along the vertical axis and their power needs along the horizontal, showing um, all the way from, from the lowest range of power needs with drifting profiling floats, tsunami detection buoys, all the way up to, to devices and platforms which require the most largest amounts of power, such as HF radar systems for measuring um, coastal currents and hybrid AUV ROV systems. Next slide, please. So there are some really great existing examples of how marine energy has been coupled with ocean observations to power those platforms. On the left, you can see a wave-powered uh, profiling um, package um, developed by Wirewalker. And just underneath that, a much larger platform called the Fred Olson Lifesaver, which UW and APL have deployed an environmental monitoring package on. In the middle, uh, we have the wave glider system, where wave energy is used for propulsion, including this example for sensing um, being performed by NOAA. And on the right, uh, we have a really interesting application of, of thermal ener engines uh, using thermal gradients in the ocean to power um, underwater robots, gliders, and uh, profiling floats. Next. So um, related to this, and on, on a very exciting note, uh, Jen kind of quickly mentioned this, but um, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy and NOAA are offering uh, this, this relatively new, it was announced last summer, $3 million prize that will help generate innovation in marine energy powered ocean observing platforms. So this is the Powering the Blue Economy. Ocean Observing Prize, and I'd encourage you to go to the Hero X platform uh, to learn more. Um, the Discover Prize is now open, uh, in which contestants can propose uh, novel ideas in five different thematic areas, including providing power to unmanned vehicles, buoys, floats, and animal tags, um, powering ocean communications and underwater navigation, um, working in extreme environments with ocean ops, and finally blue sea ideas that um, are all altogether different. So um, exciting competition, and we we really look forward to uh, to seeing some uh, novel new ideas for powering ocean ops with marine energy. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. And now we're going to turn it over to Levi. Uh, thanks, uh, Rebecca, for that. And um, thanks, everybody, for being here today to uh, talk about this stuff. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the opportunities for powering remote communities uh, using marine energy. Go ahead, next slide. Um, most of my expertise in this area uh, is centered in Alaska. Um, I grew up in Alaska. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work in a couple of these communities, with a couple of these communities, um, looking at not just, um, in some, it, when I started out, I was looking at not just marine energy, but I was looking at all sorts of uh, energy options, including solar and wind. Um, but several of these communities, if you look at this, 
picture are located on the water, either along the coastline or they're located along a river. Um, and so I think that really exemplifies the opportunity here that, you know, so many, uh, even our cities are located um, on rivers. Um, what's interesting about these remote communities around the state of Alaska is that their energy costs are very, very high. Um, so each of those uh, dots there that you see that is red has uh, energy costs in excess of 50 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is probably at least five times, uh, roughly five times what you pay at home. Um, and several of the communities are paying more like a dollar uh, per kilowatt hour. So it's, um, and the way that they, most of these communities get their energy is uh, they have what we call diesel powered microgrids. Um, so they're not connected to any kind of large scale electrical grid. They have their own little grid that they've built that connects all their houses and their um, their health centers and their community centers. Um, and then somewhere in the community, they have a, a powerhouse that has a diesel generator in it. Um, and one of the challenges with that is that they have to get the diesel to the community. And in several cases, um, in many of the communities, they're barging the, the fuel in, uh, in the summertime especially. Um, but sometimes if they run out of fuel in the middle of winter, uh, it has to get flown in by plane in 55-gallon uh, drums or in really bad scenarios when the runway is covered with ice or something like that, they have to have a helicopter come in and fly barrels of diesel in uh, to keep the lights on in the community. So um, a lot of different renewable energy sectors are looking at these communities as sort of opportunities where they can demonstrate their technologies uh, and help reduce the cost of energy for these communities. But um, as I said earlier, the fact that these communities are located in sort of a marine environment or a riverine environment makes them per particularly attractive for uh, marine energy technologies. So I've done some work in Yakutat, uh, which is a community in southeast Alaska that has a really amazing wave energy resource. Uh, False Pass, uh, located at the base of the Aleutian chain, uh, has a really excellent tidal energy resource. And the community of Igiagig um, is located right at the, uh, the I call it the mouth of the river. It's where the lake flows into the river. Um, lake Iliamna is actually the largest lake in the country after the Great Lakes. Um, and that it's in a really amazing community. I'm really grateful to have been able to uh, do some work there. And they, if we go to the next slide, we'll see. Oh, yep. Um, they've had, I would say, the most success um, uh, at implementing marine renewable energy of any of these small communities in the country. And um, that's really exemplified uh, by the collaboration between Ocean Renewable Power Company and the community of Igiagig um, with support from the Department of Energy uh, and the state of Alaska to uh, install one of the first commercial hydrokinetic, uh, river, river hydrokinetic devices um, in this country. And um, one of the things I, you know, I, I'm actually in this photo, um, but I, I frequently tell people that of all the people in this photo, I probably did the least uh, to make this project happen. Um, <laughs> uh, the, many of the community members are pictured, and um, uh, the Alexana Salmon is there in the middle. Uh, she's just really an amazing community leader, and um, I think this project wouldn't have happened without the amazing leadership of, of the community, um, the community leaders, as well as the community having the, the desire to make this happen. Um, the other thing that I think is really critical to this project is, is the long-term relationship that ORPC established with the community and, and really making a commitment to, oh yeah, and really making a commitment to, um, uh, ORPC made a commitment to Igiagig to help see this through to the end, and I think that the trust relationship that was developed between ORPC and Igiagig uh, is what made this 
get to where it is today. And so if we go to the next slide, um, here's a picture of the turbine sort of just before it's deployed in the river. Um, so it's anchored upstream uh, to a large anchor in, in the river. Um, and then they flood the, the pontoons on either side of it with uh, water to sink it down to the bottom of the river. And, and, that's, and it sits on the bottom of the river when it operates. Um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a really exciting project. I know DOE is really excited about it. Um, and I'm, I'm just really grateful to have been able to be a, have a very small role in helping make it, help, helping get it to where it is. Next slide. Um, so here's a picture of pretty much the entire community of Igiagig. Uh, it's a community of about 60 people, uh, so it's very small. Um, and in the distance there, you can see the Lake Iliamna, and you can see at the the river where the river pours into the, uh, or sorry, where the lake pours into the river. You can see some dark blue water there, but then beyond that is actually ice. So this river does freeze over um, in the winter time, but it, or, or sorry, the lake freezes over in the winter time, um, but the river runs year round. So they are actually going to leave this device in year round. Um, one of the big kind of unknowns at this point, because the device was just installed this summer, um, is uh what happens when the ice starts to break up and starts to flow down the river um, and ORPC has done some studies to that look at how deep the draft of the icebergs are um, as they pass down the river and so they think they're below that um, but this is definitely a big sort of R&D piece of this project is just the nuts and bolts of ice flowing down this river um, yeah but I think you know also just emphasizing um, you know it really is a small community they have everything they you know everything they need is is here um, they've got a runway a, an airstrip uh, and um, a, a, they have they manage their trash dump and uh, yeah I'll leave it at that <laughs> um, so we did a site visit to this community about one year ago now um, and we tried to help them uh, identify their long-term energy plan and also uh, part of the goal of that work was to uh, help DOE understand what about this community made, made them be the first to try to make to do this sort of thing because um, I think DOE is potentially interested in um, trying to replicate this model of collaboration between uh, you know federal agencies and uh, the marine renewable energy industry and these small communities. So part of our mission there was to try to understand what about this community uh, made this work. Uh, and it was also to help the community formulate a long-term energy vision. Um, and I put this photo up here, you know, th there were a lot of people there. There were a lot of partnerships, um, you know, Many this project wouldn't be as successful as as it is without those partnerships, um, but it really is the community um, and their their strong leadership um, and vision to to really see this through um, that has made this as successful as it is. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say is just for any of you out there who may or may not be uh, engineering types. Um, if you're not of the engineering type, uh, maybe this, I just wanted you to know that there is, we do need you in, in, the, in our industry. We need as many people as we can get to help us out. Um, and there is sort of like a softer side of community outreach. And, you know, there's not just, it's not just environmental regulations and permits. Um, I think those sort of softer skills um, are also really valuable to the industry. So that's what I think, that's why I wanted to include this photo. Um, if you're an engineer, those types, these types of photos might scare you away. But if you're, if you have a, if you have a penchant to kind of uh, get in there and work with people, um, we need you to. Next slide. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks Levi, that's great. And we'll pass over to Scott. Cool. So my name's Scott Jenny. I'm a researcher here at, uh, 
at NREL. Um, I, I've been here for about 10 years doing a bunch of different technologies. Uh, I, right now, I primarily lead our, our economic analysis portfolio under uh, the Marine Energy team, but I also do a lot of work in, in desalination, which is what I'm talking about today, uh, particularly uh, wave energy desalination. Um, yeah, so for, so for those of you who aren't familiar, or I imagine most of you aren't familiar, but you're kind of leading off a little bit what Nathan talked about a little bit. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different wave energy technologies that are out there. Um, there's no one technology that, that works for, for any one system. Um, but for our, our purposes of, of research, we, we selected uh, a type of technology that has been commonly looked at for different uh, desalination technologies, and that's a, a, that flap technology or surge WEC uh, on the left. And, and basically, as you can see through the, the image here, it's, you know, it's a device that, that oscillates back and forth as the waves come by, and you can use that to, to pump water or, or other working fluids to drive different systems. And from the desalination side, there's, a, again, a number of desalination technologies that are used, but the most common across the board is what's reverse, uh, referred to as reverse osmosis. And what that is, is it's a technology where you have a semi-permeable membrane, or you can imagine, think of that almost as a, a very uh, tight filter, if you will. And what you do is you take, you know, seawater, in the case of this image, it, that'd be the stuff that, you know, the darker colored stuff on the right with a bunch of particles in it, which is representing salt and other organics, if you will. And as you apply a pressure to that water, you can push it through this membrane and the clean water comes out on the other side, leaving the salts and the other stuff on, uh, behind. And so what, we are, what we've actually been looking at is, is coupling these where the wave energy device explicitly create, drives that pressure. And at the end of the day, we're, the idea is to produce clean water. Uh, if you go to the next slide here. Um, this is a, a little bit of a busy slide, but I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk through this a little bit. Is basically, you know, this has kind of been our approach for or how we how we look at these problems, um, you know, from a, a more you know, integrated research approach, starting with analysis, you know, looking at some more design work, and then and ending in some experimentation. And so the the first uh, bubble here is really, you know, when we first started looking at this, it was something that the our Department of Energy um, colleagues it came to us, you know, because at the time there was a, there was a handful of uh, companies that out that were had been looking at this technology before, uh, but it was really unknown of you know how feasible is this technology from an economic perspective, and so that's where where I really got involved with this is as like I said as as the economic lead is what we started looking at is just you know given the physics of this system, given the cost of some of these components, and and how you would couple these things together, you know, does this really make sense from, you know, can somebody make money on this, you know, at least enough to get this going? And, and really our, when we did our first, you know, high level study, the takeaway was there might be some, some actual potential here. So we, we took this on to a next phase and, and we started looking at more uh, simulations of, of the system. And so this is when we really started digging into the physics of what's actually happening uh, when you couple these two systems. Um, and what we were trying to find is, is really just understand some of the, the assumptions that we had made in our first study, try and figure out if there's any metrics that were particularly interesting or, or, or necessary for us to understand this further. Um, and, and the takeaway from this, uh, it, it, it's hard to really see anything meaningful here, but there's that, that, that graph on the right, which just looks like a bunch of spiky black lines and, and noise is, was our, you know, was essentially what we simulated for what the output of this system is. And the big takeaway here is if you were to show this to anybody who's worked in the reverse osmosis industry, uh, they cringe and they want to crawl in a corner and, and cry if they see this, because what you actually want to see is a nice flat line and, and not something with a bunch of spikes in it. So we started redesigning a system. We started working with, um, uh, communicating with some, some partners on the industry side, particularly at the time it was Dow Chemical, uh, which actually is now uh, DuPont, uh, they have now recently split off, but they're a, a big uh, reverse osmosis membrane manufacturer. And after talking with them and, and working with them, we, we redesigned a system that they felt was more reasonable. They, they thought it would work, but they, they couldn't provide any under, um, specifics on um, what, how, what they thought as far as, you know, could they validate the performance. And, and the reason for that was they've, they've never really had to look at this, this 
uh, system. And I think one thing that uh, is maybe worth pointing out here is you know, back to that, that point of people wanting to see a nice straight line as opposed to this a series of spikes is that traditionally with uh, reverse osmosis and most other energy uh, or desalination system is these are systems that are typically connected to a, a traditional grid where they have you know essentially you, you turn on a pump and that pump spins at a at constant speed and you get a nice constant flow constant pressure system and they run it you know essentially what we refer to as steady state where they don't fluctuate at all um, as you can imagine if you know going back to that that image of the the wave device going back and forth just the inherent you know the way that it, wave energy works is there inherently are fluctuations and of course there's seasonal and, and even hourly variations um, so what we really had to then start understanding is well what does that really mean from the reverse osmosis system so that's when we it's kind of where we're at now and, and these last two bullets are, are kind of a little bit in parallel here but um, you know where we're really trying to we, we've built a, a laboratory uh, experimental setup, which is that that image on the right, on the bottom right, which is a system that we've we've worked with a, a university out in Colorado, the Colorado School of Mines, uh, which has a lot of expertise in water treatment, and we've we've worked with them to develop a system that we can send pulses of of pressure and flow through these reverse osmosis membranes, and really understand what happens to the membranes from a performance side, from a uh, efficiency side and, and also understand um, reliability of these membranes in these conditions and so that's something that we're actually working with you know we're currently doing right now and additionally you know doing a little bit more work um, looking at how can we then take that a similar type of system and couple it to some of our simulation um, systems and actually simulate what a wave energy system would look like if it were actually directly coupled um, to a reverse osmosis system, which is something that, like I said, people have been have been um, hypothesizing, but no one's really actually done it at this point. So we're kind of pushing forward with that. Um, if you go to the, the next slide. Um, so this is one where, you know, this is, you know, in parallel to, to our efforts, this is something that Jen brought up a little bit earlier is, you know, there was a couple other prizes and, you know, Rebecca just talked about one. This is our, our other prize, which is the, the Waves to Water Prize. And this is a, a, a Department of Energy sponsored, um, NREL is heavily involved with, um, essentially a prize that's looking at, um, essentially uh, uh, looking at how do we, you know, the same problem of how do you actually produce water from, from waves. Um, it's a two and a half million dollar prize. We're about halfway, you know, just almost halfway or about a quarter of the way through, if you think of how you look at a time, we're ending, ending our second and fourth phases. Um, but that's something that, that is still ongoing. And actually, if we go to the next slide, I can go a little bit more. Uh, it, it, as I mentioned, it's a four-stage four prize. There's a, a concept stage, a drink stage, a create, or sorry, concept design, create, and drink stage. Um, we are just finishing up that second design stage now. There's a couple others, you know, the create and drink and are going on. But basically what we're doing is we're asking people from, you know, industries, universities, there's even, I think, actually one high school team even that is um, submit an application in that, that first stage to essentially pitch what their idea is of how, how what's the better way to, to actually do this? How, how would you really design a system um, that can produce water, and specifically in our in our application where we're we're looking at something that can be deployed quickly um, in a matter of uh, you know a day or so, and produce water for um, you know a short period of time, and, and similar to what you might see in a disaster response. Uh, the design phase, which is ending here shortly, is is more of a a, a more modeling effort. So people will be submitting um, numerical and different model and simulation activities. In the third phase, they'll be demonstrating some of these these systems through prototypes and, and lab scale. And then our final stage is an actual in um, in ocean test where we're actually going to be demonstrating these technologies um, and and doing it and, and actually testing out the contest and where a winner will be getting up to about a half million dollars. And that's it. Thanks, Scott. And we're going to turn it over to Robert. Hi, I'm Robert Ray. I, uh, one of the newer people here at NREL. I, I do uh, mostly instrumentation and data acquisition systems, and uh, one of the projects I'm working on is to develop a, uh, uh, a system for testing 
the performance of uh, a wave energy device that's currently in Hawaii awaiting deployment. Um, the next slide. My previous employment, I had uh, looked at uh, autonomous vehicles as a way of uh, replacing traditional uh, moorings for uh, measurements and um, and also uh, the, uh, the the larger vehicles were used uh, for. Am I sorry? Too quiet. <laughs> the, the larger vehicles were used um, for uh, for surveys. And what we have here is we have uh, it, uh, earlier some of the slides I think Rebecca showed. Uh, we, show, we we looked at some of these 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 types of uh, platforms. So there's the floating platforms, which are uh, surface vessel vehicles, obviously, and then we have the underwater vehicles. And the surface uh, vehicles uh, are um, they they, they self-propel for and they they uh, have instrument uh, sets aboard, as well as the uh, the underwater vehicles. Uh, similarly, the underwater vehicles. Uh, um, Tend the AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, are battery powered for the most part, and uh, the surface vehicles, uh, there are battery powered and diesel powered or engine powered, but for the most part, they are um, powered by some form of renewable energy, and that uh, is is actually a good example of the marriage of uh, of Renewable energy and uh, some sort of utility, like the uh, the the, um, uh, this, the these platforms. We have a uh, as mentioned earlier. There's the Power at Sea Prize, and this is one of the themes within the Power at Sea Prize: is uh, powering, oh, oh, finding a way of using um, marine renewables to augment the capabilities of these type of uh, vehicles. I, I want to make a distinction between unmanned and autonomous. So um, unmanned means just that. There's uh, no persons on board, whereas autonomous means that the vehicle is actually uh, able to make decisions on its own to carry out a mission. And uh, you could have manned autonomous platforms like, like a Tesla, and uh, but um, uh, but there is a distinction, and there, there's, there's sometimes some confusion because the names are used interchangeably. Uh, next one. So, how are these platforms used in in different uh, different industries? Uh, there's uh, different applications, uh, and probably the the biggest consumer or user of surface uh, uh, vehicles or the uh, the the underwater vehicles. Are um, uh, in what you call industries such as like oil and gas and um, uh, security, aka the military. Uh, but there is a lot of interest in and in utilization in science and with surveys. So surveys would be like um, uh, mapping the ocean floor, and uh, science is uh, you know collecting uh, data that would uh, help with uh, weather forecasting and um, and industry uses them extensively. Uh, in my former job, I was I was working in industry, and we were looking at ways of of uh, reducing the cost of operating these vehicles. And um, one of the, one way to do that, is, like with the AUVs, the um, we saw a slide earlier that, that Rebecca showed that. Uh, the um, the AUVs had the highest power consumption of all of these uh, underwater vehicles, and because of that, they you know they're only they're so, they're only so large can only carry so much uh, in the way of battery power, uh, durations, run times uh, top out around 24 hours, typically much shorter. So when they put them in the water. They do the mission, whatever they're doing, whether they're doing a pipeline survey or they're uh, doing a, a, an oceanographic survey. Uh, they need to be collected. That requires a vessel to stay out at sea with a crew, keeping pr uh, costs up. So the idea is, well, the only reason why it has to come out of the water is to charge. 
So if, uh, if you can increase the residence time of these underwater, that would reduce cost and increase the utility. Um, next slide. So that's uh, kind of what I, I talked about in, in the previous slide, but the, in the, the picture is actually a concept from the Power at Sea competition that's, that's uh, currently open, is, uh, is, is an idea of how uh, the AUVs and some sort of marine renewable technology can work together. Here we have uh, a, um, a, a, a current turbine connected to a, a battery bank and uh, then there's uh, over in the right side is is a is a dock for an AUV. So the AUV would uh, um, uh, slide in there and and uh, and be charged through an inductive type of system. Uh, a, uh, um, the DOE is currently funding a project with Florida Atlantic University where they're looking to to build a. a a surface vessel that can harvest some sort of marine energy. I'm, uh, we, I'm not sure if they're headed towards wave or current, but it, it will uh, it will harvest marine energy and then use that to charge a, an AUV or even an aerial drone. And uh, yep, and <laughs> there happens to be a picture of it on the bottom is the. Uh, is the platform they're using. It's called a WAM-V, which is a catamaran type of uh, a device. These can scale quite large, so that's one of the advantages. And, uh, and with the surface vessels or vehicles, uh, one area that, that uh, is, is where you can marry the uh, AUV or the underwater vehicles and the surface vehicles is the surface vehicles actually augmenting the capability of the underwater vehicles by providing uh, a navigation or um, communications relay since uh, um, AUVs really can't, they can't broadcast to say satellites. So um, by talking to the surface vehicle uh, that can then relay uh, command and control. I think that's probably about it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks Robert. And when we finish it off, we're going to let Ariel talk a little bit about uh, opportunities to engage more students in marine energy. So, Ariel, go ahead. Great. Thanks, everyone. And um, um, thank you, everyone, for hanging in there on the last presentation. And I'll be pretty quick on this one. I'm Ariel Cardinal. I'm uh, the Water Power Program Coordinator here at NREL. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so as Jen briefly mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, this year the U.S. Department of Energy and NREL are running the first ever marine energy collegiate competition. Uh, Nathan, you can go to the next slide. So what that is this year is we are asking students to envision um, creating a, a device, a wave energy or tidal energy device that powers some aspect of the blue economy. Um, so it could be like the concepts that were discussed already on this call, um, or it could be really any, any energy need at sea. Um, and the students are going to be creating a written report that they will be judged on, and then they are all invited to attend this year's International Conference on Ocean Energy, uh, which is being hosted by the United States and held in Washington, D.C. And there they're going to give a public pitch on their concept to um, some mock judges. And uh, also they'll have plenty of opportunity to interact with the industry and the participants of the conference. And they'll create a non-working tabletop scale model of their concept. And um, yeah, this is a year-long event. The teams were all selected in November. Uh, they have started working on their concepts, uh, hopefully and are they're due in May. Um, and like I said, this is the first ever competition, so we're really excited about it. We have 15 teams from all across the country, including a team in India. Um, and we're, we're hoping that, you know, they can you know, take this knowledge and uh, possibly, you know, educate um, the high school students with it and go to their local communities and, figure out ways that they can engage and make people aware of marine energy. Um, and then as Jen sort of mentioned at the beginning of the call too, this is a great opportunity, not only for the students to learn a little bit about marine energy, but also 
um, for DOE and NREL to learn about, you know, possible feasible concepts that can be applied in the blue economy. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. And so I, another, you know, great thing about the competition and this webinar right now is we're really trying to educate um, college and high school students about the possible opportunities uh, for careers in this field. Uh, and as Levi sort of mentioned uh, at the end of his presentation, there's a wide variety of skills that are needed for this workforce. It's not just engineering, we need tradesmen, we need people working on ships, we need um, project managers, business folks to, uh, you know, get a plan on the market and really just, you know, almost anything to get this industry going. So um, really lots of opportunities out there uh, and just excited to get this initiative going. And that's all. Thanks, Ariel. And thanks for everyone that's still on the webinar. And we've reached the end of our presentation. I know we're a little bit over the hour, but I'm sure everyone that was on presented would be happy to spend a few minutes answering any questions that you might have. So to you, Melissa. Yeah, so um, if anyone has any questions, like I said, just uh, type them into that group chat box um, and we'll make sure to read them for the, the expert. Any questions? Remember, the best part about um, participating live in these is that you have these experts right here to be able to ask any question you have. Um, as I noted, yes, we, we are recording the webinar. That will be up on the NOSB website tomorrow, and we'll also get it out through our social media, so Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But yeah, you can find it. If you just go to nosb.org, um, we have a, the main page has a story about this webinar, and the link will be available there. Okay, the first question is, have MREs shown any positive or negative impact on the environments they've been installed in? Have they shown impact on local organism populations? Um, so in Igiagig, uh, they've done a bunch of work in terms of monitoring um, fish interactions with the turbine. So this is actually the, the photo, the, the turbine that I showed was actually the second turbine that they've installed in the community and that happened this last summer. Um, but they installed a similar turbine, I'm going to say four or five years ago. Um, and they closely monitored the, monitored the fish interactions and the fish, uh, I would say like a handful of fish would swim up to the turbine and kind of look at it and sit in its wake a little bit, but they did, they observed no fish fatalities and most of the fish swam far around the turbine. So the, this river, um, the, the Kfijak River where this turbine is deployed um, is home to the Bristol Bay. It, it's where a large fraction of the salmon that are part of the Bristol Bay fish, salmon fishery in Alaska, which is the largest salmon, wild salmon fishery in the world. Um, so a large fraction of those fish uh, spawn in the 
waters upstream from the where this turbine is deployed. So that's a big issue for the community is they really want to make sure that the impacts are minimized. And so far, the 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 results are that there's very little um, in, sort of interaction and no fatalities uh, from this turbine. But there's actually been quite a bit of work also at Pacific Northwest National Labs uh, looking at um, there was a study where they sort of tried to simulate if a tidal turbine were to strike a whale, for example, uh, would it damage the whale? And the result was essentially it it might be like it might it might give the whale uh, sort of a bruise or a slight headache if it hit it on the head, but it's not going to break the uh, the skin of the whale. Um, as far as smaller scale creatures, phytoplankton and plankton and things like that, I'd, I'd say there's been less work in that area. Okay, um, we also got asked, how do entry level engineering positions in marine energy compare to more traditional fields of power generation in terms of pay, stability and availability of jobs? Uh, that's very going to vary a lot based on what re renewable energy or traditional energy, I would say, career you want to go through. Um, you know, marine renewable definitely much more closer to early stage. So a lot of the people that are involved in the work these day or today, uh, generally research scientists, um, the national labs play a heavy role. So you definitely would anticipate having. Uh, you know, a little bit higher of a degree than just your bachelor's. Um, but as the industry matures, as what Ariel had mentioned before, you will need more people that um, have more hands-on experience, operation working on uh, ribs or small inflatable boats to deploy these. So I would say at the moment, it is a lot more research-based work. In the future, it will become a lot more practical, a lot more similar to maybe if you weren't out, were to go out and work simply for the wind or maybe solar industry actually installing uh, solar arrays or wind turbine farms. Yeah, I might just add to that. Um, I feel like it's really exciting to be in like this new, this is Levi Kilcher speaking. Um, I feel like it's exciting to be at the cutting edge um, in terms of, you know, trying to map out and um, be a part of making a new, a whole new industry happen, but it does come with, um, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you know, how, if if we aren't able to figure it out, um, you know, you might say that a, a lot of our work was was uh, our time was uh, lost or something. But on the other hand, I think it's um, it is really exciting. Um, but I think across renewable energy, it's an exciting time. Um, you know, I, I think some of the most stable. Uh, career paths in the energy sector are in renewable energy. Um, you know, the demand for, you know, um, electrical engineers who can do integrate, who, who can integrate all different types of renewable energy technologies into grids. Um, there's a lot of demand for that. You know, obviously installing solar panels, installing, you know, uh, doing operations and maintenance on wind turbines. All of those areas are, are growing rapidly, and I think that that's just going to continue. Um, uh, but but I think everyone here at, at the involved in this marine energy team is we're all passionate about uh, being a part of of, a, of of the frontier. Okay, last chance. Any other questions? Okay, um, Brandon from UNH, who's participating in the competition, the MECC, says they're looking at developing an MHK tidal turbine to be implemented within existing or new estuarine bridges. Um, they're looking specifically at the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, they're trying to work to quantify the overall global opportunity for this, this sort of application. Do, they, do you have any resource suggestions or any particular sites you might be able to suggest? 
Somebody just asked me this question uh, like a week ago. <laughs> um, um, that's a that's a tough one. Um, but uh, I, I guess I can't say more than I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, but because it keeps coming up, uh, I think I'm going to have to look at it, look at it a little more closely so that we have a, a better answer for for this question. I apologize, I can't do much better than that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, I would like to very much thank you, our experts tonight who presented. Um, I know it takes a lot of effort to, to pull things like this together, so we appreciate that you spent the time, um, both with the NOSB and your MECC students. Um, again, I've noted that this uh, is recorded and we'll have it up on our website, and we do ask that you please um, share broadly with others who you know who are interested in the topic, um, whether they're an NOSB student or part of the MECC. Um, it's a resource that we definitely want to be used. So uh, it'll be up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, and I'd like, again, I'd like to thank our guests, and I'd especially like to thank them for highlighting um, sort of this new wealth of careers that's opening up in this area. Um, one of the things that NOSB loves to do is to highlight what jobs are out there for students, um, and especially for those who might not be interested in doing sort of real ocean science, but they just want to sort of be connected to the ocean. I think this, um, as they said, having the need for people in business and everything else associated with um, marine renewable energy, I think opens up quite a few opportunities and I'm glad that they were able to highlight them this evening. So um, once again, thank you for joining us and thanks to our presenters and I hope everyone has a good night. Thanks everyone. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody.